Well, why don't you turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, and we'll read verses 1 to 17. That's page 875 in the Pew Bibles. Matthew 21, 1 to 17, page 875. Matthew 21. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you. At once you'll find a donkey tied there and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them, and immediately he will send them. This took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Tell daughter Zion, see, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. Then they laid their robes on them and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their robes on the road. Others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them on the road. Then the crowds who went ahead of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken, saying, Who's this? And the crowds kept saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus went into the temple complex and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables and the chairs of those selling doves. And he said to them, It's written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple complex and he healed them. When the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonders that he did and the children in the temple complex cheering, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these children are saying? Yep, Jesus told them, have you never read? You have prepared praise from the mouth of children and nursing infants. Then he left them, went out of the city to Bethany and spent the night there. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. There's an outline there in your uh, newsletter, uh, household questions, top right, God willing. There'll be a time to uh, ask questions at the end. If you've missed out on any of the sermons in this series, they're all online. Uh, I'm very thankful for those who run our technology. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, authority, power, identity. Authority, power, identity. Uh, if you want to braid three ideas together, those ideas are always together, aren't they? Authority, power, and identity. Uh, it, it's been the case across history, and it's the case today. Just listen to the news if you consider the debate around the Middle East or the war in the Ukraine or the coming presidential campaign in America, it's all about authority, power and identity, isn't it? Authority, power and identity. And when you dig into them, you realise that they're actually quite nuanced, very complicated. Different levels of authority, legal authority, local authority, relational authority, moral authority. And then those levels of authority are played out in different uses of power. The use of military power or media power, the use of popular power or local power or international power. And when you look at power and authority and how they mix together, you then get an idea about someone's identity or the identity of a people group and the two bounce off each other. Now, it's not just out there either in the news. Uh, Power, authority and identity take place in the local soccer club too, don't they? They take place in the school playground or when you choose your new SRC at the end of each school year. Those three issues are intertwined when it comes to debates as big as domestic violence and as wide and encompassing as civil war, authority, power, identity. When you look at history, you see someone like Rosa Parks sitting on a bus in the 1950s And you see authority, power and identity, don't you? Or you listen to Mahatma Gandhi at Indian independence. You watch Nelson Mandela in a cell, Charlie Perkins establishing a new government department, the debate about state of origin, a new king over a realm. Authority, power and identity. 
authority, power and identity. And it's no different when Jesus goes into Jerusalem. Let's pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thank you that you have all authority, that you have all power, and that we know your identity as you exercise that authority and power and speak it to us. Father, your word expresses your authority, power, and identity. Father, help us to be willing bystanders watching Jesus come into Jerusalem. Uh, Please bring us face to face with the authority, power, and identity revealed here. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've been walking with Jesus to Jerusalem for a while. It's much easier when you sit on a Sunday rather than walking with him, isn't it? I'm thankful we get to read about it rather than walk those dusty roads. We've been reminded time and time again that Jesus is good news for the outsider, the sinner who needs to be brought into God's kingdom. We've been reminded again and again that only the dependent are in the kingdom. The independent are outside the kingdom, those dependent upon Jesus for everything. We've been warned as insiders about taking such grace for granted, haven't we, of being overly self-confident with what God has given us. We've been reminded of the nature of greatness in God's kingdom. Remember that was last week as Stephen talked to us about how Jesus is misunderstood. Greatness is seen where? Well, the Son of Man did not come to be served. <laughs> but to give his life as a ransom for many. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? Well, just look at who's on the throne. And he did it for outsiders. As we've walked with Jesus towards Jerusalem, we've journeyed from the far north of Israel, far north of Israel, down to the capital, Jerusalem. Uh, It's really helpful to remember that Jesus conducts 90% of his public ministry in a small triangle at the top of Israel. 10 square kilometres in a small geographical area right up in hillbilly country around the Lake of Galilee. And then he's journeyed from there to Jerusalem. And the best analogy I could come up with is you do all your country singing in Wabiga and then you take your fans and walk all the way to Tamworth for Country Music Festival. That's what Jesus is doing. He's going from Wabiga to Tamworth from the far reaches out on the edge to the centre of power. And as we reach Jerusalem, Jesus has timed his journey perfectly, hasn't he? Because he arrives at the start of the week leading to Passover. I don't think we grasp how significant Passover is. Uh, Australia Day has got nothing on Passover in terms of national identity and who you are. Remember Passover? That was when God's people were in slavery in Egypt and God flew over Egypt and the price paid for salvation was the death of all the firstborn. And God's people remember this every year. They all come to Jerusalem. Everyone comes to Jerusalem. The population expands. It's a tenfold. It's a week of intense emotion and expectation. The Romans are so scared of this week that they bring in all the hardheads from all the regions to keep control of the city. And in this week, over a million sheep are killed. So you mix all of that together, the smell of the blood, the sounds of the slaughter, the sounds of the celebration, all these Romans on edge, all these Jews gathered together, and Jesus walks in. Jesus walks in. And Matthew slows us down. The previous 30 years of Jesus' life are covered in 20 chapters. The last 10 days, we get eight chapters. Matthew slows us right down. And as he does, he wants us to pay attention to what he's writing. I hope you noticed in that passage how he had four Old Testament quotations, didn't you? And they structure the whole passage explaining the various events. Look there in verse 1. I'm at point 2 on the alley. When they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus then sent two disciples telling them, go into the village ahead of you. At once you'll find a donkey tied there, a colt with her. Untie them, bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you should say that the Lord needs them. Immediately he will send them. Jesus has come to Jerusalem. 
And as he's come to Jerusalem, Matthew wants us to know he approaches Jerusalem and he stops and looks at Jerusalem across the valley and stands on the Mount of Olives. Now, he didn't stand on the Mount of Olives to make a tourist attraction 2,000 years later. He stood on the Mount of Olives because the original readers knew this from Zechariah 14. And then the Lord will go out to fight against those nations as he fights on a day of battle. On that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. It's judgment day. God's come to town. And Jesus stands and he does so knowing the deep, old power behind him, in him. He sends two of his disciples to do a job. Do you notice the tone of Jesus there? Go, do. (laughs) Sounds like a king, doesn't it? The events are clear. Now, we don't know whether they're clear because Jesus was really well organised or because he's supernaturally capable. Whichever one it is, he's clearly in control. He does exactly as he commands, and and the disciples go, and everything turns out exactly as he said. Now, Matthew wants us to know that this isn't about Jesus organising a Uber or anything like that. This is about Jesus fulfilling the power of God, the desire of God. Look, the Lord has proclaimed at the end of the earth, say to daughter Zion, look, your salvation is coming. His reward is with him. His recompense is before him. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. We need to be aware of what Matthew's doing here. Matthew is pointing us to the king coming in all power and authority and identity. And he's entering his capital. Now, the original readers wouldn't be surprised by this. We're surprised at kings. Remember King Charles and his coronation? There weren't many donkeys in that parade, were there? They were big white stallions, weren't they? With impressive men sitting on them? God's kings didn't work like that. This is Solomon's coronation. Then Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Cherethites and the Pelethites went down and had Solomon ride on King David's and took him to Gihon. God's kings, what do they ride on? They ride on donkeys. Always have, always will. In fact, God warned his people to have nothing to do with horses. Kings ride on donkeys. And so when the original readers read this and they remember Isaiah and they remember Zechariah and they remember Solomon, they go, oh, we've, we, we know who this bloke is. He's a king. But he's a king with a paradox, isn't he? There's no doubt about his authority. Look at how he commands and acts and organises the backdrop of everything he's done. A look at what he's done in the previous three years. No doubt about his authority. No doubt about his power. No doubt that he's the king, and yet how does he wear it? How does he ride that donkey? Well, he holds his power lightly, doesn't he, humbly and gently. He he doesn't ride into the city thumping his chest saying, look at me. Did you notice what Matthew leaves out of the Zechariah quote? Did you notice what he didn't highlight? He didn't talk anything about Jesus being victorious. He talked everything about Jesus being a humble king. The victory will come, but at this point, it's God on a donkey. At this point, it's God on a donkey. And it's not a mistake. Jesus is very self-conscious, very self-aware of what's going on. He's not an upstart pretender who suddenly found himself here at the start of this week and, wow, I'm going to take advantage of the circumstances. No, this is the old power of God coming to the fore in a new world and it's in line with the desire of God, the desire of God to reverse the curse and the king trots in on a donkey. The disciples have prepared the donkey map point through in the outline. They're only a a matter of about two or three kilometres out of Jerusalem. So it's not far. 
The crowd goes before Jesus and after Jesus. Cloaks are laid, branches cut in place. As they travel, do you notice what they sing? Because they sing and they pray and they make a noise. In the crowds, verse 9, who went ahead of him and those who followed kept shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The crowd actually sings a poem, a, a prayer from the book of Psalms. Psalm 118, verses 25 to 26, Lord, save us. Lord, please grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. Hosanna, it, it literally means, please save us. So as they go into Jerusalem, in front and behind this, we haven't got Matthew pulling an Old Testament quote out. We've got the people who are with Jesus pulling an Old Testament quote out, saying, look at the one descended from David, and gee, we want him to save us. We are desperate for salvation. We want this one to reverse the curse, this one from the family of Abraham and the family of David. And the crowd sings this as they come into Jerusalem and then they go head bang into another crowd. There are two crowds here. There's the crowd that have wandered all the way from Wobby Gar to Tamworth from Galilee to Jerusalem, and then there's a crowd already in the city and the two crowds go head to head. The outsiders meet the insiders. The dependent meet the independent. Those from Galilee meet the insiders from Jerusalem. And the insiders, did you see what happened to them? Look there in verse 10, when, they, when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was shaken. What's the question the city asks? Who's this bloke? Who's this bloke? When was the last time Jerusalem was shaken? Well, it was when Jesus was born and the wise men came. Same question, who's this bloke? Who's this bloke? He doesn't fit our plans, this bloke. We've got our rituals, we've got our power structures, we've made our deal with the Romans, we value our independence and a bloke from Wabigar, a guy from Galilee, he wants to tell us that we need saving. And the insiders say, who's this bloke? And the outsiders have a very clear answer, don't they? Haven't you heard of Jesus? The one who speaks the word of God, the mouthpiece of the divine, who's come from Wabigar, from Galilee, and the whole city is shaken. The humble king, God on a donkey, shakes the capital of insiders. And those who've come with him, who've depended upon him, the outsiders, pray a prayer, Jesus, please save us. Please save us. On that point four on the outline, Jesus comes into the city. At the first place he goes, well, we shouldn't be surprised, it's the temple. Uh, the temple is that huge, big picture in the middle of the capital, a picture of a house because God wants to live with his mob. Verse 12, Jesus went into the temple complex and drove out all those buying and selling in the temple. He overturned the money changers' tables, the chairs of those selling doves. He said to them, it's written, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you're making it a den of thieves. Jesus goes into the temple and he clears the temple. The temple's organized in a series of squares. And right at the center is the picture of God himself, the Ark of the Covenant, Ten Commandments. And then you move out. And, and, and the, outer, the outer square, that's the square for the foreigners, for all the Gentiles. That's us. And you know what they've done with that? They've made it a stock exchange, both in terms of money and animals. And there's bleating and there's barring and there's mooing and there's cooing and there's chinking and there's dollars and there's coins and Jesus comes in and he kicks them all out. I don't know how long it took him. But when he does, he's not having a go at the sacrifices, he's having a go at where these people have set up. I'll bring them to my holy mountain and let them rejoice in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. I want us to notice, it's not Matthew quoting the Old Testament, it's not the crowd. Who's quoting the Old Testament here? 
My house. What have you done to my house? What have you done with this court? He quotes two of the most significant prophets from the Old Testament, Isaiah. God's clear desire, were you listening to Roz? (laughs) God's clear desire is for the foreigner, the eunuch, the broken, the damaged, the isolated, the mourning, the oppressed, for them to be brought into his house, to be so connected with God through Jesus that they are welcome in God's house. And what have they done with the court that symbolises that? They put every barrier possible to make sure the outsiders can't come in. Every barrier possible. And the Jeremiah quote, well, that just exposes the hypocrisy of God's people. Has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your view? Yes, I've seen it too. This is the Lord's declaration. If you go a little earlier than that in Jeremiah, the insiders are very good at their rituals. They know the these and the thous and the religious language. They know their way around the services. And they save that for the Sabbath and the rest of the week. And yet they bank on the Sabbath covering up what they do the rest of the week. If I'm devoted on this day, doesn't matter about the rest of the week. They've turned it into a den of thieves. And Jesus clears my house. Can you see his authority and power and identity? They're so intertwined. And Matthew actually does something really remarkable here in verse 13. He suddenly switches to the present tense. Come and stand next to Jesus and listen to what he does to his house and listen to the question he asks his house and listen to how he cleans his house. As he clears the temple, I'm at point five on the outline, the dependent come to him. Do you see that there in verse 14? It's a wonderful image, isn't it? The blind and the lame came to him in the temple complex. Notice how that comes after the cleansing because they can now come in. And he healed them. And when the blind and the lame come, who also is singing in the complex? The children. Notice that the children are singing the prayer. Jesus, please save us. Hosanna, please save us. The dependent recognised Jesus. He welcomes them. The outsiders come to him. He welcomes them. He heals them. They recognise him and they pray for salvation. Those insiders, they're indignant. How dare the dependent speak up in the house of God? How dare the broken come in? How dare the foreigner set foot in this place? How dare, do you hear what these children are saying, Jesus? Yep. I know exactly what they're saying. In in fact, let me tell you what they're saying. And where does he quote? Again, it's a quote from Jesus, from Psalm 8. Because of your adversaries, you've established a stronghold from the mouths of children and nursing infants to silence the enemy and the avenger. Do you, do you notice what's going on there? We stop before those last few words. So we stop at that comma after the infants. So why do the infants talk? The outsiders speak, so the insiders are shut up. The dependents speak, so the independent are made silent. Puts a whole new tone on Psalm 8, doesn't it? Jesus is effectively saying to the insiders, look what God has done. God has taken the dependent of the world to make the independent be quiet. God has taken those you have rejected to shut you up. God has taken the outsiders and brought them in. So the insiders, those who trust in their family tree, those who trust in their moral behaviour, those who trust in their upstanding places in the community are made quiet. And again, do you notice who speaks the Old Testament quote here? It's Jesus. 
And again, Matthew takes us into the present tense, so we stand right next to him. Which, which, are we asking the question or are we singing the prayer? Power, authority, and identity at the last point on the outline. They're all intertwined, whether it's the SRC, the local soccer club, council elections, right through to international politics, power, authority, identity. We know that mix, don't we? That braid that runs through our town, our world, our history. Matthew has helped us see this braid, this braid of power, authority, and identity as Jesus enters Jerusalem. Matthew makes sure that we see what is displayed and he frames it by the very word of God, doesn't he? That's why those four Old Testament quotes are there. Jesus is recognisably the king, God on a donkey, and he uses his power with great humility. Humility is knowing your place before God. Jesus knows his place. Jesus' authority, power and identity are displayed in his complete control. He organises his donkey and he cleans his house. Jesus is recognised as the one alone who will bring salvation from brokenness, restoration from sin. The outsiders flock to him in the face of the stubborn insiders. Jesus expresses this power and authority to clean his house. I'm God. I'm God. And my desire is for the outsider to be inside. Jesus accepts the praise and prayer of the outsiders because he's organised their words to silence his enemies. And then Jesus exercises his power and authority to do what with those outsiders? To bind them up to heal them, to fix the broken and the damaged and the belittled by sin. Four scenes, a braid that runs through the middle, power, authority, identity. What what do we do with it? Well, I think we can do three things. I think the first one is, do we recognise this Jesus? Do we recognise the humble king who unsettles, confronts, silences the insider and binds up the outsider. Do we recognise that, King? At the start of this last week, Jesus is not meek and mild. He's humble. But there is no opposition, no perversion, no distraction from the plans of God. This is a magnificent King, isn't it? A wonderful king, a warm king, a humble king with all authority. There is nothing illegitimate here, is there? There is no power vacuum here. This is the king and he's magnificent. He's magnificent. When he comes, do we repent? Do we repent? Repent's a very simple word. It means to turn around, to meet him face to face. As outsiders, we need to repent of grasping at independence. As outsiders, we need to repent of thinking that Jesus might not actually be powerful enough to deal with my problems or might not be interested in my brokenness. As outsiders, we need to repent because we seek other sources of authority when the king's already in the city. As insiders, we need to repent if we're offended by Jesus. We need to accept that he'll unsettle us with his clear identity. We need to repent when he confronts our apathy and when we pervert the clear desires of God. As insiders, we need to repent if we have silenced the outsider or we've placed obstacles by way of ritual or upbringing or behaviour or language in front of them. When we meet this king, do we repent? And thirdly, do we respond? This is the king. We've turned back to him. Do we come to him with our sin? 
Do we come to him with our disappointments, our laments, our brokenness, our lack of contentment? And when we come to him, do we actually expect him to make us whole? Do we desire him to make us whole? As insiders, do we hear Jesus' rebuke and consider how we might have kept the outsiders outside? Maybe by our language, by our jokes, by the economy we run, perhaps by our lack of grace and kindness and gentleness. As insiders, do we hear Jesus' rebuke and consider the clear desire of God for anyone to enter his house? Let me pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your king is magnificent. Uh, Your king is humble God on a donkey. Uh, Your king is welcomed with prayers of salvation from the dependent. Uh, Your king clears the house and silences the opponents. Your king welcomes the dependent and the outsiders, binds them up, makes them whole, deals with their sin, as we will see in a matter of days. Father, thank you for this king, for King Jesus for the way in which we've come face to face with that braid of power, authority and identity as he's walked into the, as he's come into the capital. Father, please forgive us. Father, please enable us to follow in the desires of the King. In Jesus' name. Amen. Any questions? Yeah, Ros. Yeah. What was their their habit? Is that what you mean in terms of the temple? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think they have been the the picture we get of the Old Testament, especially in places like Deuteronomy six, is of children being welcomed into the gathering, and then the gathering of the big household is modelled on the gathering of the little household, the home. And in Deuteronomy 6, we see those brought together. At no other point do we have any idea that they're not welcome or that they don't have a place. Uh, I think the period we're dealing with here has come after the 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew, and there are a number of habits and behaviours that have taken place in that time that Jesus is confronting as he takes them back to the old power. And in fact, when we then move into the New Testament and we see the gathering of the people of God and the pastoral epistles, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and 1 and 2 Timothy, Titus, those letters have sections to children which are read to the children in the gathering. And so both sides of this seem to have a picture of the gathering of God's people with children welcome and outsiders. Ray, What happens to Rahab? Rahab's welcomed in, isn't she? Uh, an outsider who really should should be there. So I think The pattern of God's people has always been for the outsiders to be in, and children are an example of that. There seems to have been something that's developed in this period that has pushed them out. 